Welcome to this week's edition of Outdoors Online, a weekly webcast produced by the North Dakota Game and Fish Department. I'm your host, Tom Jensen. My guest this week is Jeb Williams. Jeb is, of course, the Wildlife Division Chief here at Game and Fish. Jeb, every year about this time, we do our webcast on the big three, moose, elk, and bighorn. When are the applications going to be available, and when is the deadline? Uh, the application should be available here very soon, Tom, probably within a, within a week. Uh, for surely, probably the online applications um, within that week for sure. And then the, the, dead, the deadline for the, the application process is March 22nd, Wednesday, March 22nd. We're going to take each individual species separately. We're going to start with elk. Are we issuing more or fewer licenses this year? More licenses issu issued for, for elk, so that's an exciting thing. We've had, uh, in, one of the questions over the years has been in the western part of the state anyway, is as far as how are, how are elk numbers going to do outside of the park, especially when they, after the park, uh, you know, did, the, did the population reduction within, with, within the park, and what's that gonna mean for the, for the elk on the outside of the park? And we know that there have been more and more elk that that don't necessarily come back to Theodore Roosevelt National Park, that they have basically established a home outside of the, the park boundary and, and know that as home. And so um, the good news is over the years that those elk numbers uh, have done quite well outside of the park, actually probably better than maybe some landowners would like. I think the <laughs> landowner tolerance button has been pushed a little bit in some sure. areas. And so that's one of the reasons we're increasing licenses in E3 this year is to, is to increase the amount of uh, antlerless licenses out there as we've had discussions with some landowners who have requested some additional tags. So um, we think that's good opportunity for the public and uh, we recognize the landowner tolerance is important, especially when you're dealing with elk, a large animal. and. Uh, so we think it's a, it's a good uh, sportsman opportunity when we can see an increased number of elk in that part of the state. Any other changes? Yeah, we, have, uh, we actually have an additional unit this year for elk in North Dakota, which is something the department has been working on over the last couple of years. We've been uh, um, in a lot, lot of discussions with uh, the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe about, uh, about managing elk within Sioux County. There has been um, a population of elk in, in Sioux County for quite some time now, and and our more, more, most recent numbers, survey numbers, have indicated uh, about 110 elk in that area. And again, working with some landowners in that area, we, we knew that this was something the department was gonna have to sure. have to move forward on to put some pressure on those animals and, and, and again, provide some hunter opportunities. So we feel good about that. We've uh, again, had a lot of good conversations with Standing Rock Sioux Tribe on this and with the landowners in that area, all, all very much uh, big players in this game. And so E6 is gonna be an opportunity uh, within Sioux County this year. It's that portion of Sioux County that's east of Highway 31. So pretty much the majority of Sioux County and seven licenses will be offered uh, by the Game and Fish Department and then the tribe is also uh, going to be issuing some licenses in that area as well. That uh, they'll be the lottery also? They, yeah, they're, it'll be determined the at a later time uh, for them for, for tribal licenses but uh, you know we've, we've met on that and we think it's a good opportunity moving forward. Um, every year Jeb we get calls from people asking if there are ways that they can up their odds in the uh, lottery and actually there is a way. There is a way if people, we understand that people might want to shoot that bull elk in North Dakota. Um, the odds of doing that though are not very good. <laughs> if you're an individual that, uh, that plays those odds, you probably realize that uh, if you're going to shoot a bull elk in North Dakota, you're going to get extremely lucky at some point in time to do that. But if you, uh, if you put for, in for a cow license, in an antlerless license in, uh, in our units, your odds go up quite a bit. And uh, so there have been some years when your odds are uh, drawing a, a cow elk licenses are actually better than drawing a deer license in some units. And so that opportunity exists for those people that want to take advantage of it. And it is a, uh, it's a very rewarding experience for somebody that wants to harvest an elk in their, in their home state. All right, we've covered the western part of the state as far as elk goes, Jeb. What about the eastern? So typically or traditionally, Tom, we've had elk unit E1 in the northeast part of the state. And over the last number of years, we've been monitoring through a research project and working with a variety of landowners up there, providing us information about, about an expanding elk population within unit E1. And so what we know now is that there, there pretty much are two two separate elk herds up there. Uh, one in the, in the Pembina Gorge area in the kind of the traditional area of E1, but also in the Turtle Mountain areas. And so um, about four years ago, five years ago, we, we expanded unit E1 to the west 
to, to include more of Botano County and the Turtle Mountain areas where we had reports of elk being on the, on the landscape there. Um, now having some radio callers um, attached with those animals and learning a little bit more about them, we, we think it's time to manage them separately because we feel they are two separate populations. And so we are splitting uh, unit E1, and so it's gonna be E1 East and E1 West. And so that way it'll give us better management capability for managing the Turtle Mountain herd and then managing the Pembina Gorge herd. So a person has to be fairly careful then when they fill out their lottery applications where they apply in unit E1. Correct. It will e they will be two separate units. Right. And so it will be listed as such on the application to where uh, when somebody applies, they're gonna be applying for E1 East or E1 West, just like any other, any other unit out there. And so, but it will be a change that people will notice this year. And again, just a, you know, a lot, of, lot of good news there because there's growing number of elk in the state and that means a growing uh, opportunity for people that like to, like to hunt elk. Let's move on to moose. Moose, yeah, we've we've had a lot of discussion about moose over the last number of years. There's been uh, been been a lot of changes in North Dakota North Dakota's moose population, increasing numbers uh, being number one thing I think a lot of folks have talked about is we have had good uh, good moose population, especially in the western part of the state. So moose really have kind of vacated their traditional uh, habitat in the northeast part of part of North Dakota and and have kind of moved on to the, the prairie setting, the prairie landscape a little bit, which, which definitely is a little more uncommon for moose. Um, so that's been, a, that's been a surprising thing and a, it's been an interesting opportunity for us to take a look at that through research projects and to see how well uh, moose are doing in these areas. And again, they're, they're doing very well. So what we're looking at in the northwest part of the state is, is, is adding back unit M11. A number of years ago, we had unit uh, M11 in there, uh, but after the flood year of uh, 2011, we weren't really sure where those moose, if they were gonna stick around that area, if they were gonna be pushed out by the high, high water. So we got rid of it, but we're bringing it back now because we really need, we really need a concentrated harvest in some of those areas. Um, we have a, a very good moose population in the northwest part of the state. And again, we're hearing some, from some folks that would, uh, would appreciate uh, some increased harvest of moose in that area. And, and we think that's merited as well. I mean, we, instead of somebody hitting a moose along the, the highway and, uh, you know, that critter a lot of times going to waste and somebody potentially getting injured, we would just soon have that be in a sportsman opportunity associated with that instead. So there's going to be additional moose licenses in, in that area combined, uh, again, a split a split area compared to what it has been before. So unit M10 and M11 now instead of just M10. And then we're also adding some licenses in, in M9 as well, um, that where we significantly increased those licenses a couple years ago, but we're, we're still seeing pretty good numbers in that area. So um, lots of good news on the moose front, again, as far as overall numbers go and increase of hunter opportunity. There was some talk at one time, Jeb, that moose were on the decline, there was even talk that they may be added to an endangered or threatened uh, list of some kind. Correct, yeah, and that's, that's an ongoing process with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They, they were petitioned for that, for, for listing, and so there is uh, ongoing discussions about that, and we've, it's been indicated to us by the Fish and Wildlife Service that that decision is not gonna be reached until approximately 20, 2020. And so they're, they're looking at all the information available. The states are providing information to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on that matter, and you know, in North Dakota, our, uh, we don't have a large moose population, but we have an increasing moose population, and we certainly don't believe we have a, a threatened or endangered moose population in North Dakota. Does the same go uh, when it comes to applying for cows with moose as it does for elk? Very much so, yeah. People can increase their odds uh, a fair amount by applying, uh, by applying for, uh, for a cow moose tag versus, a, versus an antler tag. Let's move on to uh, probably the state's most majestic animal, the bighorn sheep. Several years ago, Jeb, we had a devastating die-off in the bighorn herd due to an outbreak of viral pneumonia. That precipitated a delay, I guess, in even announcing if we were going to have a season last year. Now this year, we are going to have a season, but you're going to delay, like you did last year, how many, uh, how many licenses that we give out of work great. That's See? correct. Yeah, we we're, we're just gonna we're gonna duplicate what we did last year. We think we thought that it uh, that it worked out uh, well for uh, a lot of different reasons. And the reason we did it last year was, uh, of course, related to the disease event that we did have for the in North Dakota. Um, but 
you know, and that's still on our radar. It's still a concern. Uh, every year that we were that we go past that, however, I mean, it's good news, and that you know we know that that doesn't completely work out of a herd for for quite some time. But every year you kind of get past that event, uh, it certainly increases your odds that that that, that your herd is going to be doing better and better. And so we feel pretty good about where our herd is at right now. Overall, it doesn't look like our herd was uh, was hit as hard with the pneumonia as other outbreaks have been across the country. So we feel a bit fortunate, a bit on the lucky side on that on that aspect. Um, but a lot of things worked out well about how we did it last year. We're able to pr provide uh, up to date, up to the minute information as far as how how that sheep herd is doing. And what I mean by that is we're able to do all of our summer surveys, complete those, and then determine that number. And so by doing that last year, we were actually able to give additional opportunity to the sportsmen in North Dakota uh, for sheep opportunities by providing eight licenses. If we would have had to set that number back in, 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 in February and March, like, you know, like right now, um, we're gonna be a little conservative generally. And so uh, that was something that we felt good about. And I think that the people uh, were very patient, uh, the sportsmen and men and women that were applying for those were very patient and understanding about the process. And um, I think it worked out well. And, and so we're gonna, we're gonna keep that process in mind uh, again for this year. With the ongoing concerns about viral pneumonia and things, is this something that we could do in the long run? Yeah, I, th I think it is. I mean, I, I think it, um, I think, like we talked about, I think for a lot of reasons that the way we're doing things now, the essentially the kind of the delayed um, process that we're seeing right. is probably something that we're going to adapt into the future, you know, maybe with or without pneumonia on the landscape. It just gives us the best possible information uh, before we determine those numbers. And I think that, you know, we're certainly supportive of that. And I think that uh, the sporting public is always supportive of that. A question that we hear quite often, Jeb, is uh, why don't we use the points system for the big three? And there's a very good answer for that. Yeah, I, I think in the past it's been discussed a lot and it's a very fair question. Um, you know, traditionally there have been so few licenses available when it comes to elk, moose, and sheep. And we have such a high application rate for that as you would have so many people that would be carrying the same amount of points that st statistically it wouldn't it wouldn't give you that much of an advantage over somebody else. Um, the biggest disadvantage would be is that those individuals carrying those points would be the ones over time, 30 maybe 35 years down the road that would get those licenses. But what it would do then is it would pretty much statistically seal your odds if you were a newcomer coming into the into the lottery process that sure. you would not have a very good chance at all of drawing a license. And so it's been discussed and I you know I think the data surrounding it has been looked at and I think everybody feels pretty comfortable with it just being a, a true lottery. Absolutely. A lot of anticipation coming up. Fill out your lottery applications and keep your fingers crossed. Absolutely. It should be a fun year. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Jim. You can apply online for the Moose, Elk, and Bighorn Lottery. Log on to the Game and Fish website at gf.nd.gov and follow the links to the application site, fill out the application, and pay the non-refundable fee by credit card. You can also apply by filling out the paper application, which is available at most sporting goods stores and licensed vendors. Non-residents can participate in the Bighorn Sheep Lottery, but they can only apply online. For Jeb Williams and the rest of the staff here at North Dakota Game and Fish, thanks for joining us for Outdoors Online. We'll see you again next week.